today, this is, this is actually a traditional part of progressive governance conferences. The tradition is that on the day before the big conference, there is a smaller meeting where we exchange progressive views from different countries. And that's what we want to do today. We want to hear from some of you how you assess the prospect of progress in your country. So are we witnessing a progressive moment after the pandemic? Is there a window of change in your countries or in your regions? For Germany, I can say that we are definitely witnessing some kind of momentum for change right now. Most of you know that we have parliamentary elections in September and the conservative chancellor, Angela Merkel, is not running for office again. And uh, there are two interesting surveys that um, assess the mood in the public right now. One is by the Bertelsmann Foundation, which has been published about uh, six weeks ago. And it Uh, it appears that, according to this survey, more than 60% percent of Germans say they want a new government. This is a very high level of uh, mood for change in a historic perspective. And um, this resonates, interestingly, with a survey conducted or commissioned by Das Progressive Zentrum two weeks ago, about leadership styles. And I think that's really interesting that almost half of Germans, according to this survey, say that Angela Merkel's successor should be A, ready for change, B, taking new paths in a brave way, and C, assertive. So those attributes are, uh, come out uh, of this survey And only 15% of people say they are keen of having more of this moderating style of Angela Merkel that we have seen in the past. So this is the mood in Germany, basically. And of course, there's also appetite for change coming or strengthening from other parts of the world. Uh, the victory of Joe Biden in the US was uh, not certain when we met last year. And uh, we are all very, very pleased about his bold policies and his victory and that Donald Trump is gone. However, I would also like to highlight one thought before I close. Um, I'm convinced, and this is maybe something for the debate later, I'm personally convinced that after the corona horror that we experienced in the last year, um, which has literally left no stone, not one stone standing in our societies. People are tired and uh, people are insecure. And that's why I personally believe that progressives must propose and implement bold reforms, yes, but without losing sight of the needs and demands of the majority that sometimes contradict progressive goals. And that's the big challenge, I think, that we as progressives face at the moment. Uh, we need a realistic plan, a realistic plan that people can follow, a realistic plan for modernizing our economies and societies, combining ecological renewal, social justice, and opportunities for all. That's me from the start. I'm really looking forward to your thoughts and impressions from your countries. Uh, and I will now hand over to Jeremy Cliff, who is the international editor of the New Statesman, and he will lead us through the program today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and thank you for that introduction. It was a very interesting overview of where we are. And I, I absolutely agree that we're at such an interesting and exciting time for progressive politics, whether you're talking about the challenges of the pandemic and the fault lines that it, it's exposed, or the possibilities of the Biden administration, um, the possibilities in the next German election. I think it's going to be such a fascinating discussion over the next few days, and I'm really looking forward to it myself. But my job is not to waffle on here, it's to keep us all to time. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is 
Patrick Diamond, Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at the Queen Mary University of London. Patrick, as I think very few of you need to be told, is a one of the most significant thinkers on the European progressive centre-left and has been deeply involved in dialogue between the British centre-left, the European centre-left, the transatlantic centre-left. Um, and he has been pulling together a joint statement by various of the partner organisations of the Progressive Government Summit. And I'm very interested to hear what that statement and what those conclusions look like. Patrick, over to you. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for that very kind introduction. And that, um, it's great to be with you and to be with all the colleagues on the call. Um, I estimated when I was thinking about it this morning, I've been coming to these events now for almost 20 years, which makes me feel very old, but also possibly well placed to reflect on um, the broader ramifications of what we're discussing and how it fits with the kind of broader evolution of progressive politics um, in that period. So as both Michael and Jeremy said, my role here is just to very quickly introduce the um, strategic paper that we have produced for this conference. And I should say at the outset that this is not just my ideas, but it's the views, thoughts, of a range of different organizations and people who've um, fed into it. And I think the key theme builds, um, I hope very much on what Michael has already said in, in the introduction, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about both the dilemmas and opportunities for progressive politics in the future. The unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the suffering it has created has not surprisingly provoked a debate about building back better. For progressives, the key political question is whether in the aftermath of the crisis, it will be possible to forge a new settlement that tackles the global causes of inequality and polarization. And here, and this really builds on the point I was making about the history of this movement, I think it's vital that we avoid the complacency that characterised progressive politics in the 1990s particularly. I think then it was widely believed that the West had reached the end of history after the fall of communism and that somehow progressive parties and movements would automatically own the future. Well, I don't need to tell people on this call that in the intervening decades, politics has clearly played out very differently. And so as we think about the implications of the COVID crisis, we need to be alive to the threats as well as the opportunities that this moment creates. And just to give a few examples of that, there is in progressive circles a lot of debate about the way in which the state has taken on new duties and responsibilities in this crisis. In nations where government has been under attack for 40 years, the rebirth of the state has been remarkable. Governments are saving lives with health treatments and vaccines and saving livelihoods with temporary economic and welfare support. Yet no one should believe that progress is irreversible. In many countries, governments are under significant fiscal pressure. Citizens whose living standards are squeezed may demand lower taxes. Managing the pandemic also requires governments to strike a delicate balance between liberty and security, which liberal democracies inevitably struggle to resolve. Second, the pandemic has shone a spotlight on rising inequality, but may also create new forms of polarization and social division. The impact of COVID has been asymmetric, increasing the divide in labor markets between insiders and outsiders. The young have suffered disproportionately from closure of schools and education systems. Gender inequalities have worsened as women often take on the brunt of caring responsibilities during lockdowns. And of course we know, and this is particularly the case in the United Kingdom, that particular ethnic groups have been differentially exposed to the virus and have suffered higher mortality as a consequence. Third, the pandemic may help to drive progress on climate change, given far-reaching and long-term changes in consumer lifestyles and behaviour, as well as in patterns of economic production. But there is also a danger that it may worsen the situation if there is an immediate dash for economic growth in the aftermath of the pandemic to recover lost GDP. So how do we preserve the progress that's been made on creating more sustainable economic models? And finally, while a global pandemic may, prov may provide a clear rationale for global cooperation, it may also encourage parochialism and chauvinism as countries turn inwards and borders are closed. Vaccine nationalism is but one example. And again, in the UK, the government is currently abandoning its commitment to devote 0.7% of GDP to development aid. So there are threats, but there are also significant opportunities in the aftermath of this pandemic to forge a new social contract. I was interested in the research that Michael referred to in Germany. Surveys of citizens in advanced economies reveal a renewed faith in the protective role of the state and a desire for greater solidarity. 
A shift, if you like, from the era of I, emphasizing consumerism and individualism, to the era of we, emphasizing collective institutions, sustainability and risk sharing. And so any new contract has to incorporate three fundamental pillars. First, strengthening the public sector and governance systems to ensure an adequate supply of public goods. Integrating services across health and social care, recognizing too that education will assume a vital importance to overcome the scarring effects of this pandemic. The second pillar has to be a new economic model to promote jobs and sustainable growth, not least to tackle climate change, but also to deal with the after effects of the economic crisis that COVID has engendered. And third, there has to be a new impetus for global cooperation, seizing the opportunities afforded by the Biden presidency. So in conclusion, I would say that of course, forging this contract is going to be a formidable task because it has to balance boldness and radicalism with the need for realism about what can be achieved in this current political environment. And in my view, it will require ideas, inspiration, thinking from across the progressive political community. I think it's fundamental that we recognize that no one political tradition has all the answers. We have to draw on social democratic views. We have to draw on the ideas of green parties. We have to draw on liberal thinking. We have to draw on positions from elsewhere on the left. And of course, critically, we have to work closely with citizens, involving them directly in this process of policy making and rethinking. And I really hope that this event over the next three days is a really important contribution to that exercise. So that's just a brief overview for me, Jeremy, and I'll hand back to you to take forward the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you for that, Patrick. A great introduction, and I think that's opened up a lot of questions for us to grapple with over the next hours and indeed days. Now, as anyone who's been to a progressive government summit knows, the first pre-summit session is a sort of taking stock of where we are. And so this session is going to be divided into two further segments. We're going to start with two perspectives on European progressive politics, one from a social democratic or socialist point of view and one from a green point of view. And then we're gonna move on to the snapshots from individual countries. I think that'll give us a rounded picture of where we are that will add to what Patrick just said. So uh, first up for these perspectives on European politics is Maria Joao Rodriguez, a president of, of FEPS in Brussels, which as many know is the think tank that is close to the party of European socialists and really a kind of reference point for all thinking on um, the kind of the Social Democratic and Socialist Party family. So, Maria Jao, without no further ado, over to you for your comments. Many thanks, uh, Jeremy, and uh, hello, everybody. Really pleasure to uh, join you for this uh, big, again, uh, go Global Governance and Progressive Governance uh, uh, Summit. Look, um, I'm bringing uh, our um, uh, reflection on the state of affairs of European politics regarding uh, the progressive agenda. Uh, basically, let me start uh, by telling you how we feel about the building back better. Um, right now, we are, of course, uh, as everybody is still struggling with the pandemics, and this is about saving lives. And basically, we are focusing on providing universal access to the vaccination. Um, and this is uh, not be easy in the European uh, general coordination. But now I think we are improving. But at the same time, this is, of course, about saving jobs. And on this front, uh, Europe uh, was able to come up with a um, solution different from the one we got in the past. Uh, we learned the lesson of uh, austerity driven economic policy and we uh, took another approach. So we went to a quite bold uh, stimulus package, uh, which is for the first time in European history financed by a budget which is based on common issues of debt. For those who remember a painful period of the financial crisis and Eurozone crisis, you understand that uh, this uh, move is quite uh, meaningful regarding European politics. And I would argue that uh, social democrats 
were quite instrumental in making this possible. Um, but then we have um, a big decision to be taken is how to use these new investment capacity. And for us, progressives and social democrats, we want to make sure that this will be used to push for the green transition uh, with the uh, social fairness and to shape the digital revolution. And we really believe that when it comes uh, the green transition, Europe is uh, in a quite uh, leading position, even below what is needed to tackle climate change. But when it comes the digital transformation, Europe is lagging behind, uh, clearly United States and China. And uh, we consider that shaping a European progressive way for the digital revolution is now a priority in front of us. Um, then we know that in order to drive this big investment plan, uh, we need to have the necessary budgetary instruments. And we have created one at the European level. We want to reform the so-called stability and growth pact to create the room to invest. Uh, but we know that in order to make these decisions really uh, feasible, needs, uh, needs to be underpinned by stronger democratic impetus. So we really believe that a new moment has come for European democracy, where we need to involve much more citizens at large. If we just take the decisions we need uh, to um, adopt regarding taxation, we understand clearly that in order to have more tax fairness, we need to have much more uh, backing, political backing coming from uh, citizens. So we are working on, on that. Let me conclude by saying that while all this is uh, being put on the ground, we also start with uh, a big operation to think on the long-term future of the European project. This is based on the Conference on the Future of Europe. And it might happen that we will take some decisions on the very architecture of the European Union with the possible implications for the treaties, because we consider that we should not have taboos about that. Last, last word about international cooperation, because I very much agreed with uh, uh, David um, and Patrick uh, Diamond that uh, in our progressive agenda, one of the three key priorities should be about international cooperation. And our um, internal debate in the light of uh, Biden's election, which is of course, very good news for progressives, is to say, this is the moment for us to work together with our American uh, progressive uh, friends. Uh, this can make a difference Nevertheless, the world is a new one. We have uh, notably this uh, strategic competition, United States and China. So we need to find a way to bring together all the forces for the progressive coalition. And this is in the good tradition of uh, global progressive governance. And uh, I think uh, I will be telegraphic because this will deserve um, a discussion as such. But I think we uh, need to identify who are the allies, the partners who can work with us to tackle the different challenges. And uh, if we uh, think about climate or pandemics or SDGs, we can have a coalition. If we think about trade and digital, the coalition to be built is another one. And if you think about democracy and fundamental rights, the coalition will be another one. So we need to be prepared for a quite uh, complex 
political strategy to make um, a better future for the world. But uh, I'm available to go on discussing this. So far, that, that's all. Thank you. Hand over to you. Thank you very much, Mirjad. That's very, very useful. And talking of forging different coalitions, obviously, um, it's true globally, but it's also true of the progressive family. So in that spirit, um, I'd like to bring in Mar Garcia, the General Secretary of the European Green Party, uh, to bring a green perspective on, on this discussion. So Mar, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also very much, uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, for a fantastic, uh, let's say, picture of the European politics. I don't want to repeat. Maybe I would just add that uh, I would just think that we need to put a bit of emphasis on this green transition that you mentioned. You very well, very well like mentioned the three topics, but I'm not sure if Europe is uh, in the exact correct way with some decisions that are being taken. So let's see if the Green Deal exactly becomes the Green Deal we're aiming for in order to achieve the Paris Agreement. But uh, um, apart from this, I completely agree with uh, Maria, the change that uh, the European Union that we're facing now compared to the one uh, that we were facing on the previous economic crisis in 2008 is completely different. And there has been a, a huge change that we must celebrate in Antes. I wanted to focus a little bit more on, uh, on this third aspect that Maria was uh, mentioning and uh, maybe you know, give it a different perspective. Um, I believe that each generation has its own historical challenge. I believe that our generation, the, the historical challenge that we're going to face is the one about organizing and managing the consequences of the globalized world. I think that this COVID-19 crisis has very much shown that. And it's also clearly stated eh, in this summit uh, paper that uh, it was being presented earlier on. Uh, we are now facing the national populists that uh, believe that this crisis has just started to indicate the beginning of the end of globalization. That's a, a message that is widely spread within national populists. They claim we need uh, what I believe is a false protection coming from the hand of walls and close borders and more nationalistic approach. Those are fake solutions, we all know. I'm not sure if it's widely understood still by our citizens, but I think that slowly they will um, uh, and see the clearness of uh, of this, uh, uh, of this fakeness. The way forward, to my understanding, humble understanding, is not to deglobalize like quite the contrary. One of the main lessons of this crisis is that it's necessary to move forward towards a new globalization. Uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez was already pointing the different coalitions that we will have to face in this field. Yeah, A new model that corrects uh, most the most negative aspects of the current ones. Which are these? To my understanding, the mismanagement of the interdependencies of all kinds that this current globalization has uh, generated. The mismanagement of the interdependencies uh, have brought very negative effects on economic, on social, and on ecological order. And uh, the global interdependencies now can, will not be able, we can no longer approach them and govern them only through the lenses of internationality or through, uh, through the lenses of their interstate relations. Yeah? Our efforts, I believe, must be oriented towards implementing governance systems, smart governance systems, that allows the interdependent convergence of needs and interests. Governance system in which multiple institutional and non-institutional uh, actors must participate. And I believe, I mean, the fact that only a, a year and a half or two years after this pandemic uh, started, that we have a vaccine, and not only this, that we have large uh, amount of populations vaccinated, it could be an example of these governance, smart governance systems that we need. We the Greens are true believers that the European Union is our best window, yeah? to this globalized world, a European Union that not only gathers enough critical mass to be a very important actor on the international scene, but that also enables us to understand how to deal with the complexity of these smart governance systems that we need. We analyze the EU as a polyarchy with its values and limitations, as a complex governance model where unity and diversity are combined. European practices are hierarchical. Authority is neither centralized nor decentralized, but somehow is shared, yeah? I believe these concepts and experiences provide us with the skills and capacities to advance in the challenge of, of governing these complex interdependencies 
that the current model, model of globalization is bringing. The European Greens have theorized that we want to uh, occupy an alternative centrality in the political arena in which we participate. And uh, it has been showing yeah, lately that our vocation is to be a government force. We're facing the many next elections to come with the ambition to be one of the main decision takers. And uh, we believe that to win the elections, uh, we need to focus very much on delivering solutions on everyday policies. Yeah, I am referring to the concrete responses that we must give to bring solutions to difficult situations faced by important sectors of our societies. I'm convinced that we must combine the economic solution to the coronavirus crisis and the necessary um, digital modernization with the aim of creating a prosperity that respects the environment. Because without environment, if we don't face the climate crisis, there will be no um, uh, um, economic prosperity, there will not be digital revolution. So in our scenario, in, in a social scenario or in the current scenario of fear, because I think we do have a scenario of fear, also of uncertainty and of necessity, specifically in some countries in Europe, I think that the political narrative that the progressive must deliver must be accompanied by solutions to the ecological, economical and social emergencies. But we cannot add something as an annex. It actually comes all together. Yeah. I believe that from the Greens, we are ready to face this, and we are also happy uh, very much to walk along with the rest of uh, you progressive forces present here today. For me, this was the first, let's say, um, time joining the progressive symposium, despite we uh, already last year um, started to participate and collaborate, but I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today and to the next days that uh, discussions that we're going to, to share. So thank you very much. Super, thank you very much indeed, Ma, for that overview from a green point of view. So we've just had two perspectives from different party families, but both from Europe. So now is a good time to look further afield, I think. And we're going to go through our snapshots of different uh, perspectives on European pol on progressive politics from different parts of the world. We're going to start with the US and the Commonwealth. So I'd like to invite Bastian Hermeson, the executive director of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung in Washington, D.C., to give his view on um, uh, progressive politics in the US. And just a reminder, these snapshots are quite short. We're trying to keep them to each to about two minutes or so. So we're just going to have a quick view from everyone. And I think they'll give us a 360 degree perspective on the progressive story around the world. So over to you, Bastian. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, greetings from Washington to all of you. Great to see you. Um, so I believe, and this has been alluded to, of course, that, that the Biden administration in many ways truly may be our last best chance for the major progressive reforms necessary in the coming decade, from addressing climate change to preserving the competitiveness of liberal democracy. And what I would like to do in these two minutes is to point out two features of Biden's approach that I think could be important lessons for progressive actors in Europe. The first is the Biden administration, and this is in line with what Mar also just said, is specifically not talking about balancing environmental, economic, and social justice concerns, but it is talking about how they are dependent on each other. And I think this is very important because any self-proclaimed progressive that argues that they can balance either of these dimensions, dimensions against each other, I think is already losing because the impression then is that these political dimensions are trade-offs and zero-sum gains. Biden makes clear that strong policies on social justice and on climate change are the precondition of economic competitiveness and the preservation of our democratic order. And I believe we need that kind of integrated thinking. Secondly, progressive actors are often known for visionary rhetoric of radical change. And I think, especially in this time of post-pandemic, when folks are focused on getting their life back to normal, this can be a political dead end. But also beyond the pandemic, you know, these times of rapid change all around us uh, make a lot of people very uncertain. And how Biden deals with this is interesting, I think, because he does not speak about radical change, but about security, about safety and stability. And he explains why his reforms are the preconditions for that. De facto, his agenda is the most radical and progressive agenda since the New Deal in the United States, but it is talked about in very practical, no-nonsense terms. He does not speak about creating a new society or anything like that. He talks about jobs. And progressives often do the opposite. You know, they talk a big game only to then enact moderate reforms when they're in power. Biden proposes radical reforms but with moderate language. 
And I think both of these factors are crucial for the success of progressive politics uh, beyond the US also at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that uh, thought-provoking intervention. We now go to Canada and to Katrina Miller, who's Progr Program Director at the Broadbent Institute. Katrina, over to you. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, joining you all today. Um, you know, I think Canada right now sits at a crossroads, as many of us do. Um, after a year of the pandemic, we have recognized um, where some of the deep cracks are in our society. We saw the pandemic hit hardest um, in our elder care and in our workplaces, largely our workplaces that um, you know occupy, were occupied by low-income workers who are already marginalized in our economy. And there is a great national sense right now of needing to do better. And you know, our poll, poll after poll in Canada shows that most Canadians want a strong, bold, progressive transformation in recovery, one that brings equity to everyone. Um, the question is, how does that happen? Right now in Canada, um, our government's plans around recovery are quite short-term, actually. Uh, we've made some big commitments to a child care, national child care plan to help the economic recovery, particularly economic recovery for women and families. Uh, we made some big commitments around stimulus in order to transition our economy to a clean economy as part of our climate change commitments. Um, but these uh, two particular investments and, and plans sit uh, sort of in a solitary space without a full robust plan around that to ensure a, a comprehensive recovery and also lack uh, lack any details as to how they'll be implemented and whether or not they'll be imp implemented properly. Really at the heart of it, what we lack is an understanding of how the stimulus spending that Canada hopes to do and the leadership it hopes to provide um, will happen in a smart way that targets um, our economic stimulus, targets our social spending in a way to uh, to actually achieve the outcomes that Canadians are looking for. And this rides up against the fact that Canadians are becoming more and more anxious about the affordability of life and more and more concerned about whether or not uh, the deficits created by this spending will eventually come to their door for them to pay for. Um, and this brings up the issue of fair taxation, um, which is a very big issue in Canada with you know well over 70% of Canadians wanting to see a progressive taxation where people with greater wealth, greater income, pay more in taxes to help pay for this recovery. I think I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Thanks very much, Katrina, and great to have the Canadian perspective. Obviously, we'll also be interested in what uh, a Canadian PM Justin Trudeau has to say on Wednesday. That's a really, really useful background. So now to the UK for Anthony Painter, who's um, Chief Research and Impact Officer at the RSA. Anthony, what's the perspective from Britain? Thank you. Well, it's good to hear all this sort of um, hope and positivity and optimism. I'm, I'm afraid the UK likes to be the old man out nowadays, so we're going to be slightly less optimistic in what, what we say. But let's start at the top and then we'll probably go a bit downhill from there. Um, th there's no doubt that the UK population have um, uh, increasingly progressive uh, values uh, around climate, the state, social justice, and public services. So you, you think that would be an enormous opportunity for progressives um, in the UK, but support for policies doesn't necessarily mean support for program um, or leadership. And what we're facing, I think this is an important point in the, in the wider debate, is that we're facing a, a, you know, a right that is shifting. We've grown used to the sort of populist right, if you like, using this sort of the, the mechanisms of fear, anxiety, polarization, division. Um, and, and these are somewhat easier targets um, for progressives than what we're actually facing in the UK, which is a right which is driven more by optimism and a bit of cultural distraction and also deep politicization of the resources of the state, you know, steering those resources towards favor constituencies, a sort of clientelism. And this is much more difficult to counteract. So we've gone from sort of take back control to sort of more global Britain and leveling up. And these are more sort of positive political messages. Um, and essentially what progressives are facing is an environment where critique is sort of portrayed as sort of negativity and pessimism. 
And I think some of that is sticking um, in the minds of the UK electorate. So there might be wider lessons um, for, for progressives as to what is happening in, in, in the UK. Progressives, and you know, that covers the Labour Party, of course, the Liberal Democrats, the Green Party, and you know, even some of the national parties like the, um, like the SNP in, um, in many ways, are, are deeply factionalised between each other, deeply polarised um, by nation, values, sort of faction and so on. The Labour Party itself is sort of trying to rid itself of um, a, a sort of period of um, anti-Semitism with, it, with its membership. It's trying to recover some sort of dialogue between its own factions. It's very inward facing. Uh, currently, the Green Party is struggling to make inroads. Um, you know, I, I think that they're, 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 they're sort of catching some imagination, but the political system holds them back. Liberal Democrats kind of bump up and down. The SNP, of course, is dominant in Scotland, but I think it has an enormous battle ahead over Scottish independence um, and a possible, if not probable, referendum. It's not at all um, predictable which way that will go. And the SNP itself, I think, may struggle through, through the process of, of understanding how to redefine itself depending on, on, on the outcome. So what are the possible responses? You know, there could be a sort of um, progressive alliance. And at the moment, we've got a sort of European style politics in the British system, which doesn't work for progressives at all. Um, but a progressive alliance where there's deeper dialogue around the issues um, and core challenges that have been referenced already today um, has some possibilities to it. Um, but alongside that, that depends on the Labour Party rejuvenating itself and the political system um, that is that is the UK. And how do you counter this sort of this this completely optimistic story? It's completely optimistic, sort of forward-looking populist conservatism. And probably the only way is 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 a sort of optimistic counter-narrative. Um, of its own, and that's what Labour has to discover. And I imagine learning from the US example that will be centred on economic security of some description, obviously contextualising in wider climate politics um, as well. If Labour can find that optimistic story, that optimistic counter-narrative, it has a chance. Um, if not, the deep divisions on the progressive politics side in the UK um, probably harden sort of um, lay out the ground for at least another 10 years of conservative rule. So enormous challenges here. Thanks very much for Anthony. And I couldn't agree more about the case for the Progressive Alliance, which I've been making myself in the new states, but we'll, we will see what, what comes of that. Um, so next we're going to New Zealand, where we have a the one recorded statement uh, of, of this session. Um, she couldn't make it uh, now, obviously a slightly difficult time difference. Um, so, um, over to Cathy Arrington, the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation, for some thoughts that she's recorded for us on The View from uh, New Zealand. Hi, my name is Cathy Arrington. I'm the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. We're a public policy think tank based in Auckland at AUT University. And that's the reason why I'm joining you by pre-recorded video rather than live. It's about 3 a.m. my time uh, when this session actually starts, so, so this is a bit easier for me. But thank you so much for having me, and I thought I would say a few words to set the scene for where progressive politics is at at the moment in New Zealand. Uh, we, of course, have one of the most popular prime ministers that we've ever had. Um, Jacinda Ardern is known globally for her leadership through the pandemic where she oversaw the New Zealand government successfully eliminating the coronavirus, which after a six week lockdown and starting in March 2020, uh, life has gone on almost as normal in New Zealand in a way that is hard to imagine uh, for many people uh, who, who haven't been here. Uh, so off the strength of that huge success, uh, Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party won the biggest victory that uh, it, it's won the largest share of the vote that the Labour Party has won in 50 years and also the first time ever that a government has been able to, a single party has been able to govern alone uh, since our current voting system was introduced in 1996. So the progressive bloc in Parliament at the moment in New Zealand is as strong as it's ever been. Uh, the Labour Party has 65 seats out of 120 and their partners in the Green Party have a further 10 seats. So that's 75 seats in the progressive bloc. And you could add another two seats to that from a small party, the Māori Party, uh, but uh, historically the relationship between them and the Labour Party has not been strong, uh, but, but of course it's politics, so you never know and things can change. Uh, so you could even say there are 77 seats in the progressive bloc at the moment in the New Zealand Parliament. 
On the other side, the uh, National Party, the main centre-right party, they, they won only 33 seats and their partners the, who are further to the right, the ACT Party, won 10 seats. Uh, so the Conservative bloc holds only 43 seats out of 120, which is a very poor result compared to, to where they were sitting um, even just before the pandemic. It was on track to be a very close election, but that's not how it worked out. Um, I would say at this point, the big challenge facing our government uh, is the force of expectation. Uh, there are many deep structural issues in New Zealand that have gone unaddressed for, for a long time for, for complex reasons, things like housing affordability, uh, entrenched inequality, uh, even um, cultural, culturally divisive issues like drug law reform are in the public conversation now in a major way, and the government has been pressed to take these issues up and they, because of their enormous majority, they have no one to blame but themselves if they choose not to do so. So, so the weight of that expectation is huge and I would say that is the, the primary challenge they're facing now is trying to maintain their enormous electoral advantage in the face of the huge expectations of their supporters. Okay, we're going to the next comment from Germany and Ellen Uberscher, President of the Heinrich Böll um, Foundation. So let's hear from you, Ellen. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of this uh, really interesting uh, round to hear from all over the world about the state of progressive um, actors. Um, I was asked for a German perspective and I will add some points um, to what was said already about the overall state of European uh, progressive forces and uh, what was said about the green uh, uh, yeah, view towards uh, what's going on at the moment. Um, from a German perspective, the state of progressive actors and alliances is, from my point of view, fairly mixed. So um, I have a slightly different uh, view than uh, Michael Mierbach uh, uh, gave in the beginning. On the one hand, of course, in Germany, we see um, Germany managed this COVID crisis quite well for the people. And we do have out of 16 state prime ministers, nine from progressive parties. So this is also, of course, this kind of management is their success. This is... Um, the one hand on the other hand we see the progressive movement as such stagnating in the political field in germany and in some ways i really can follow up what uh, anthony was uh, was uh, is, uh, telling us about um, uh, britain the international decline of social democratic parties for instance has reached germany the left party does not substantially increase their chair even in their home state, so to, to speak, in the former, in the states of the former GDR, they haven't met approval for many years. The support for the Greens does increase, but taken together, progressive parties continue to represent a population share just below 50% on the federal level in Germany. Meanwhile, the continuing support of right populist actors, right wing populist actors such as AFD, has been perpetu perpetuated, especially in former Eastern federal states. So they are part of the political, an important part of the political scene that hasn't changed between 2016 and 21. While the progressives represent a fairly weak political dimension, I tell as it is. Reflecting on the most, regent, uh, most recent regional election in Sachsen-Anhalt, um, a federal state in East Germany past Sunday, which is uh, very new, progressive parties have either remained static or substantially lost votes. The goal of avoiding a majority of AFD, of the right-wing populists, was reached by a large amount of left and SPD voters swinging to the conservatives and not by, a, by an alliance of progressive parties. On the other hand, we observe, and that is uh, now the, the other uh, um, side of the coin, we observe an increasing support for the Greens 
uh, on the federal level uh, and in, uh, in, in, in two different parts. On the one hand side, during the last 10 years, they more than doubled their membership. So their party, be party base became much stronger. On the other hand, they meet constant approval within the society and the Fridays for Future movement gave them a momentum. It has never been the case for the Green Party showing 20% voters approval or more in the polls, but this has been the case now for months. This, uh, of course, is a, is a positive um, is a, a thing for, for when we look to, to September and the national um, the federal election. And this goes along with the polls at the end of May um, of this year. 29% uh, of Germans believe that climate change is the most important problem in Germany, the second uh, important after uh, the COVID crisis. And as the significance of COVID decreases, the significance uh, of, of this item, climate change, um, uh, uh, rises. So how to explain this gap between rising Greens and decreasing progressive actors? The Greens understand themselves as the progressive force in Germany, but there is, in terms of climate and nature protection, a conservative, conservative element within the movement. And as far as the society is concerned, Alliance 90 and the Greens, they stand for the freedom of individuals as a heritage of the uh, GDR civil rights movement. And they stand for emancipation of women and LGBTIQ people or black and colored people. And this is, yeah, so to speak, a liberal element of the Greens. And my very brief explanation for Green success in uh, Germany, unlike other parties in the left of center, would be that parties from only socialist traditions lose approval, whereas Alliance 90 Greens meet approval because of their unique mixture and the ability to address people's aspirations for change and uh, for uh, uh, for change and for um, preservation at the same time. Um, and I would say the the a second point is that the Greens uh, they they uh, the impression the overall impression they have a positive uh, view to solve problems. We can cope the climate crisis, but we have to uh, take the me measures. From my point of view, these are the two uh, reasons. Uh, there might be, of course, more, and there are more in-depth analysis, but I leave it here for the moment. Let me add only one point, as the urgency of the ecological transforming our, um, uh, uh, as the urgency grows for e ecologic transformation, the need for establishing trust in transformation is also increasing. That was what uh, um, uh, Bastian Hamson was hinting at. And uh, with it, the significance to bring and think issues and context systematically together. The progressives and the Ger in German cases, uh, in, in the German case, the Greens have the potential as well as the window of opportunity to transform Germany sustainably and to bring social and environmental and economic questions together rather than finding bad trade-offs between them. So this uh, was it from my side. I, uh, 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 there's a new article out with some more um, ideas. I'll post it to you. Thank you. And for those looking in the chat, we also have, I don't know if you've all seen it, um, Florian has posted the, uh, the PGS 21 uh, summit paper that Patrick introduced. And we also have from Laszlo in uh, Budapest, a, the, uh, F, F, the FEPS book on the future of Europe edited by Maria Israel. So do take a look at those two. Let's then move to our next live speaker, which is Laszlo Andor, the Secretary General of FEPS to talk to us about the, the view from Hungary. Laszlo, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, Maria spoke on behalf of FEPS, so my um, focus is uh, regional, uh, not only speaking about um, my own city and country, but um, I would say Central Europe, which we can define as uh, 
the formerly Habsburg um, um, territories, a kind of Klein Staterei. Um, and um, there, there are very interesting tendencies in this small um, region, which I do believe that they, they have uh, significance for Europe, but also specifically for the progressive family. At the beginning of um, the conversation, Mikhail was also asking whether there is a, any kind of post-COVID momentum uh, for the left to re-emerge uh, you know, with more energy um, than before. And uh, without being categorical, let me just say that this is a region where the cooperation between uh, the Greens and uh, the Socialists is real. It's not only an idea. Uh, starting with my city, where uh, the Lord Mayor is um, a left green and uh, Budapest has uh, uh, practically the most left-wing uh, government ever. Um, the Lord Mayor is going to speak in this uh, conference. Uh, and um, you can see that um, uh, this kind of uh, rearrangement, um, regroupment um, of the political landscape um, affects all the major cities, right? Prague has a green major, mayor. Uh, Zagreb recently elected um, uh, one um, who is a kind of left green and uh, entirely new phenomenon uh, in uh, this region. The color of Vienna has not been changing in the last 100 years, uh, but you know, it also is possible only because the Greens can go into a different type of coalition on the national level, but they stay with the left uh, when it comes to the city, because the city has to be serious. So uh, overall, I think um, uh, this uh, tendency, of course, uh, um, is, is, is becoming a more general formula, maybe not so much uh, at the moment with Slovakia, uh, which is a, a bit behind in the schedule. Uh, they are still with the fragmentation of the center left, uh, which was the case with us um, about 10 years ago, um, in, also in, in, in Croatia um, uh, a few years ago when um, uh, the Social Democrats lost power, uh, there was a split subsequently. So apparently there has to be a split first, maybe a bit of a, um, a, a refreshment. Um, let me just highlight that you know, this green mayor of uh, Zagreb was elected after a long tenure of a social democratic mayor uh, who unfortunately was a crook. And um, you know, to, to ensure that people who represent um, uh, bad habits, bad legacy, legacies, having been corrupted by power, um, as long as, um, as, long as um, you know, there is no way to deal with these problems, obviously, socialist and social democratic parties, um, East and West, I think it's not only an Eastern issue, East and West um, have to uh, work hard uh, to, to regain a strong base and to prove that uh, there is a capacity not only to govern, but also to avoid the mistakes of the past. Mistakes of the past also means falling into the neoliberal uh, tendency what concerns uh, uh, the economic uh, orientation. Um, on the other hand, this region is also very interesting and I think this has many, many political implications. Um, this region now is a kind of battleground um, in terms of economic strategies, uh, cyber warfare, uh, energy policy, um, between, let's say, Western Europe and the USA on the one hand, Russia and China on the other hand. Major political crisis in the Czech Republic is about the engagement of Russia. Uh, this is the region where Russian and um, Chinese vaccination has been spread, of course, without being recognized by the European Union. Um, energy policy, uh, modern in other countries, nuclear, non-nuclear, uh, major investment uh, projects for infrastructure, uh, Russia and China are popping up, and this uh, kind of confrontation is indeed a major issue. Which side you take um, when it comes to uh, this clash of uh, the major powers um, uh, is, is, is a very interesting uh, question. Because for the Czech party, the Social Democrats, I think it's going to be um, the death knell that they actually took the wrong side. And the, and, and the left-wing constituency, especially the young uh, left-wing voters, do not like the choice of the Social Democrats um, in this uh, question in the Czech Republic. 
So um, uh, I think these are interesting specificities um, which re require an attention to the nuances of the region. Uh, consequently, and that's my last point, um, when it comes to the discussion on the future of Europe, it seems that the existential questions for this region are slightly different than the mainstream of Europe. In the mainstream, it comes to how to rebalance uh, the European uh, you know, economy, uh, how to make it pro prosperous, overcome the, con the, the constraints of fiscal policy, making the, uh, the European policy more democratic and engage more citizens. In this region, people look at you know, completing the enlargement with the Western Balkans. Uh, you know, don't hesitate, go for it, uh, create security on our border. Um, and security on our border also means uh, uh, somehow dealing with uh, non-Christian migration in a kind of sustainable and structured uh, uh, manner due to the tremendous demographic de decline. Most of these countries in Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe are suffering. Uh, or have been suffering in the last 20 years. So um, these questions obviously um, call for answers also from the progressives where the socialists agree. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laszlo. And so now on to Poland and um, Philip uh, Konopczynski, who is a board member of the Kaleki Foundation. Philip, over to you for a, a quick comment. We're now running slightly up against time. So if everyone could try and keep it relatively tight, that would be great. Okay, over to you, Philip. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, well, when we talk about uh, progressive politics and policies in Poland, we have to very much differentiate between one and another. On one hand, there have been some positive changes, uh, mainly the ruling uh, nationalist and traditionalist uh, PIS party has been um, at least ever, uh, ever since the 2015 election when they came to power, they've been moving towards slightly more progressive economic agenda. And right now with, uh, uh, with the changes introduced at the very top by Biden and the EU of the European Recovery Fund, it seems that it's actually the um, super right-wing party that's gonna benefit the most from the, at least part of the changes in the, in the global uh, economic shift in the in the in the, um, in the economic model um, taught at the universities and used by by uh, central institutions. So that's that's one um, aspect of it. On the other hand, there's also some um, reasons to be optimistic about the um, green uh, transformation and the changes uh, that might affect the um, environment uh, in the region, but but also all around Europe. Since again. PIS is uh, changing its, um, well, let me just say that uh, uh, even half a year ago, there were still PIS uh, party members um, that would deny the very existence of global warming. Right now, the whole economy is gonna, is gonna start tackling the, the necessary um, changes in order to uh, make Polish economy less pollutant and, and more environmentally responsible. Well, of course, that puts that puts um, uh, certain problems towards the relationship between the progressive movement and the green movement. And we have already seen tensions between the unions here in Poland um, and the progressive movements, especially in the Silesia region, where um, there's been a quite uh, um, quite big example of, of how that might also affect the international relations with the conflict between Prague and Warsaw um, over a, a, a coal mine. Well, that's, that's, that's the government side of things. On the opposition, uh, well, it's even more complicated. Uh, on one hand, uh, there are some good news again, because the, the left has uh, finally united under one banner, and uh, um, that led to, to the reemergence of the left-wing parties um, as a uh, strong political bloc within the parliament. But then again, uh, the polls do not show that it's a growing movement. Uh, on the contrary, uh, there is a, a new political force that's uh, gaining momentum. Unfortunately for uh, the progressive, it's a centrist, conservative, um, and very, very much anti-system uh, movement of uh, Mr. Szymon Hołownia, who used to be a celebrity and, uh, and a, let's say, a Catholic preacher, and right now is forming a new government that's trying to balance itself 
um, between the PIS and the civic platform. Another trend that's happening on the politic, uh, political side of things is uh, the growing division between the centrist liberal, liberal parties and the left-wing parties. Um, that actually led to a, a quite um, atypical coalition of the forces that supported the implementation of the European Recovery Fund here in Poland, because it was the, the majority of the current right-wing government alongside the left, uh, the progressive left that supported the, the bill to pass. And, and that was quite a shock. It stirred the, uh, stirred the general public, but, and I think it's, it's going to lead to way uh, for, for uh, a further uh, division between those two forces. So, uh, okay, I, I see my time is up. Uh, I just wanted to mention that along with the progressive changes in the economy, there are very serious issues related to the human rights. And that's, that's exactly where, where Poland and countries in our region do need uh, Western support um, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to matter uh, a great deal. Thanks very, thanks very much, Philip. And obviously that question of, you know, uniting the opposition is also an important one elsewhere in Central Europe and elsewhere. Um, so from Central Europe, we're now going to Latin Europe. And we'd like to start with France and Lionel uh, Zanzou, president of Terra Nova. Um, Lionel, are you there? Yes, I'm pleased to be with you. Um, good afternoon. Um, I prefer Latin Europe to Southern Europe because I'm, I'm not sure that we are completely southern. Um, um, I would say we have two French uh, paradoxes. One is that uh, the strength of the social model, uh, soci socio-democratic model has been proven <clears throat> during the pandemics as efficient and approved by the vast majority of the population in terms of uh, active support in the management of the pandemics uh, for households, uh, state-owned companies, uh, private corporations. Uh, we have put in place quite an efficient Kurzarbeit uh, uh, system inspired by, by Germany, which has been efficient. The disposable income of the French uh, households uh, is in progress in 2020. Uh, which uh, is, is, is quite amazing for an economy which uh, has been in a recession of uh, north of 8% uh, uh, of the GDP. And in a sense, this has been very consensual. But strangely enough, uh, the strength of this social uh, model and this uh, state proactive uh, set of policies has not perceived as such by uh, the public opinion by the media, by the social networks, which are today media and social networks dominated by non-socio-democratic and, and far more conservative or populist uh, strength forces. Uh, so the, the political <coughs> uh, landscape um, is, is not consistent with what has been uh, experienced uh, during the management of the pandemics. And it's not that clear that in the 11 months uh, before the presidential election, uh, it could be translated in a recovery uh, of uh, the progressive forces. It's absolutely unclear. Uh, when you see the, the opinion polls, the nationalist slash populist of the Rassemblement National, the <coughs> former National Front, of Mrs. Le Pen is quite high uh, in uh, the, 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 the opinion uh, uh, potential votes for uh, next year, starting with a test with regional uh, elections uh, in two weeks, where it could well be that uh, among the 13 regions, the sort of French Lander, um, uh, which become more and more powerful, could, could well be that the National Front, the Rassemblement National, uh, could win uh, several of them uh, against not the right, but uh, the left. Uh, so we are not in the situation which was described for Germany, even if we have the same trend of socio-democratic decline, uh, but you have as a sort of a counterpart, 
the growth uh, of the green, and altogether you are probably a bit below 50% for the progressive forces. In the case of France, we are hardly, uh, if you combine both uh, green and uh, social democrat, we, we are hardly uh, reaching 30%. And it has never been uh, since the war that low. Uh, as if we had a sort of political um, uh, explosion of the classic parties, uh, and they have been exploded by uh, Mr. Emmanuel Macron. And he has, he, has, he has created a sort of great coalition at the level of voters, but not at all at the level of parties and all parties, the Republican uh, uh, in right, center right, and uh, the Socialist Party uh, and others <clears throat> leftists. Uh, I mean, in terms of parties, uh, it's really completely ex exploded mm -hmm. with no incarnation. And the second paradox is the fact that those forces, Green and Sociodemocrat, uh, are completely divided. And if you take a major uh, <clears throat> element, which in other countries could solidify an alliance uh, on the uh, climate uh, change adaptation and, and a strong uh, recovery uh, in terms of energy, energetic policies and environmental values. Even on that, it's totally fragmented because in France, 92% of the uh, electricity is non-carbonated thanks to the nuclear program. And the nuclear program divides completely the socio-democrats from the green. And within the Green Party, uh, they will hardly probably reach sort of 10% of votes in a general election because they are totally divided among themselves, even if they have had some progress in local uh, uh, elections with important mayors. mayors. So the, the social forces, the, left, the progressive forces are divided everywhere. The Socialist Party is, has essentially exploded in sort of three different factions, uh, but the Green are not more unified. And the combination... Uh, uh, Lino, I have to yeah, ask you to I'll finish. finish. Draw together I'll there. Finish. That's, I'll finish that's with really, that. really interesting. With only one word, the risk for the success of Mrs. Le Pen is the progressive voters abstaining mm. in a choice in between Macron and uh, Mrs. Le Pen which means today the extreme right is at 48 percent of uh, potential votes in the presidential election we have a real real risk yeah no it's alarmingly close thank you for that very thought-provoking overview of the situation in france uh, Lionel. and now we're going to go to italy and giuliano da empoli the chairman of uh, the volta foundation um giuliano are you there, are you there? Ah, yes Hi, please give us your thoughts from Italy. And if you can keep them relatively brief, that'd be great as we're running slightly over time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, Hello, I can yeah. hear you now. Can you hear me? Indeed, yes, we can. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to take part to, the, to this conversation, which uh, uh, sound, sounded very interesting from this last contribution I was able to, to, to hear. Uh, just a brief outlook from, from Italy. Uh, we're in a quite unusual situation because uh, for the first time uh, in a long time, uh, Italy is now, the, the, the political system is uh, um, full of, is converging to the center in a way. It's been centrifugal going in all kind of extreme directions for so many years now. And this is possibly the first time in, a, in, a, in, in the last 10 years where uh, the, the, all the political forces are are crowding the center so you have uh, movements like like Salvini's league who you know now loves Europe and you have the five star movement who used to want to abolish parliament who now i mean is the new christian democratic party and and all that 
so that in a way is good because uh, because of course you, 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 it's good for progressives and 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 somehow it uh, it, it makes us stronger. Uh, in 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 another uh, in another way, it's not so good because first of all, the the reasonable center, which used to be just occupied by the by the Democratic Party, uh, the, the PD, is now crowded, and uh, I think the identity crisis of the PD is is, is even more obvious. Uh, that's part, obviously, of the of the social social democratic crisis that you must have mm, mm, again mentioned in the in the previous contribution. It's it's particularly acute in Italy, where just to give you one image, uh, you have to imagine that the last three secretary generals of the PD are today not even no longer members of the party. So uh, <laughs> it's not that they're not in charge anymore. It's that they're not members of the party anymore. They, they've gone off, found, established new parties and, and stuff like that. So this gives you, I think, an idea of where we're at. There's a new leader, uh, uh, Enrico Letta. And of course, he's a bit trying to surf on the Biden wave. Uh, but it remains to be seen if there actually is a Biden wave to, to, to surf on. And uh, and and right. Yes. I mean, this week he launched a new I mean, he's, you know, uh, uh, that the, 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 there's a big new campaign about taxes and inheritance tax mm. and 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 all kind of PKT claims. So it's, it's this new like progressive uh, centrist radicalism that is that is uh, being being tried out. Uh, I think it it remains pretty confusing at at this stage, but I'm happy to, that the I mean I'll be able to 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 get so many good ideas from the from the PGS summit this year. Super. So I'm sure that will be uh, that will help. Thank you very much, Giuliano. That's a very useful introduction to a government that I think many of us in Europe are interested to see how it develops. So let's go to Spain and Matteo. Uh, Pairucet, who is a political analyst at Fundación Alternativas. Mateo, please, uh, a quick view yeah. on the view from Spain. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Thank you, Jeremy. So the progressive coalition government in Spain under President Pedro Sánchez is having to face numerous challenges, but it's look, it looks like it is more resilient than many would have predicted initially. It is worth reminding that Spain's political culture was averse to coalitions at the level of national government. In fact, the government that was born at the end of 2019 with PSOE and Podemos was the first coalition to govern the country since democracy was restored in the late 70s. So with this in mind, many people believe that the coalition wouldn't take too long to crumble under the weight of the ideological differences between the two parties. Inevitably, the COVID pandemic presented a major challenge only four months into the coalition, a challenge which the government uh, responded to by approving a minimum living wage for the most uh, economically vulnerable and by allowing businesses to cut costs, temporarily laying off workers while the state covers 70% of their salaries. So that's in the economic terms. Then, of course, the territorial challenge of Catalan secessionism is still there. Pedro Sánchez is still confident in pursuing a strategy that in Spain we sometimes refer to as the ibuprofen strategy, which consists of a less confrontational approach than the preceding conservative government, prioritizing dialogue and bridge building instead of resorting to the judiciary. And as we speak, the government is paving the way for a pardon for the imprisoned leaders of the unilateral declaration of independence of October 17 but with fierce opposition on the right, that the Conservative Party, Partido Popular, and the far-right box will join again a demonstration against these pardons this Sunday, a demonstration where there will also be members of the Liberal Party, Ciudadanos, which in two years has crashed from dreaming of the presidency to practical irrelevance. And then there is the uneasy diplomatic situation with Morocco, which is right now the most important foreign policy challenge for the coalition which is also divided on the issue of the Western Sahara. Spain lacks the type of foreign policy consensus that exists in other countries. So events like the diplomatic crisis that erupted a couple of weeks ago are systematically exploited by the opposition to erode the popularity of the coalition government. 
moving forward, the coalition has two years ahead until the 2023 election. Many political commentators were and still are convinced of a breakdown in the coalition before the next election, but remains to be seen as it has proved to be quite resilient. The support for both parties in the coalition government appears to have suffered a drop in polls, but it is something that the government will aim to revert by spearheading the post-COVID economic recovery with the help of the next generation funds, 140 billion euros to promote green investment, digitalization, and in short, help Spain take the lead towards a more modern and competitive economy. In any case, the vaccination campaign has picked a rapid pace in Spain. The health crisis caused by COVID seems to be receding and the country is looking forward to leaving behind uh, the worst consequences of COVID over the summer. And yeah, that would be a wrap up for, for Spain. Brilliant, thank you. That was, that was really insightful and concise, uh, Matteo, thank you. So we're now going to, for our final region, to the Nordics. And I'd like to invite Lisa Pelling, the chief analyst at Ariana Ide, to um, speak to us about the situation in Sweden. Yeah. Um, Lisa. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Congratulations on the Progressive Governance Summit. I'm so much looking forward to the coming days. And uh, we are such a proud partner here in Stockholm. Two sentences about the situation in uh, Sweden. So we have, like many other countries, uh, social democrats are competing about being the largest party with two equally big forces. We are at 27% that social democrats rise at the moment a slight COVID-19 boost, uh, as the, um, the strategy paper pointed out. Uh, also in Sweden, COVID-19 proved that a strong state, a strong society, something good, gave social democrats that are currently in government a kind of boost. But Conservative Party are not far behind at 22 percent of the of the vote in the polls. And what is even more worrying, just behind them are the Sweden Democrats with around 19 percent of the votes. Uh, the progressive government in Sweden, which consists of the Social Democrats and the Greens, are a progressive government governing despite the fact that Sweden has a blue brown parliament, uh, which um, not having uh, its own majority in parliament forces this government to make very painful uh, compromises now recently about the introduction of market rents in newly built uh, buildings, which is a very important breach of Sweden's tradition of having negotiated rents and would introduce an extreme neoliberal market sense of, of rent setting that we haven't seen in, in many other countries. We've also been forced to accept uh, neoliberal deregularization of parts of the labor market, very painful uh, negotiations between the partners on the labor market. So we are, we are struggling. We are hoping that we will continue to gain some ground. We have general elections coming up in September next year. So we are hoping that uh, progressive forces now in Germany will show the way in September this year so that we can join the same progressive train for next year. Looking forward to the coming days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And now to Finland and Juha uh, Lepernan, uh, CEO of Demos Helsinki. Many, many thanks. Good to see you all. Many thanks, Jeremy. Many thanks, everyone, for really interesting contributions. Uh, so essentially, right now, uh, we have the most progressive government coalition in power for decades, uh, with a very popular prime minister, Sanna Marin, uh, here as well. Uh, there are two years left of the mandate. Although the centre-right, the populist party, are currently polling higher, the jury is still very much out in terms of the next parliamentary elections in two years' time. Uh, but more importantly, the current political cabinet also has progressive political ambitions, uh, one of which is fairly well known, which is carbon neutrality by 2035, or to rephrase, building a carbon neutral welfare state. So basically reconfiguring the new Nordic model to an extent. So essentially what this does achieve is bringing progressives in Finland to the forefront of the challenges uh, that progressive face when pushing for transformative changes. And to simplify this a lot, uh, even if there would be progressive political ambitions, unless there is a governance system capable of implementing transformations, progressive policies are limited or unsuccessful. Uh, 
And there was a really, really good example of this now in April here in Finland. Our political coalition was willing to push for progressive fiscal decisions that required trans transcending the so-called frame budgeting mechanism, which essentially caps debts. Uh, and the public outrage uh, from administrative hegemony uh, was quite significant and also translated into public and media outrage. So essentially, the incapability to model investments on social or climate outcomes uh, is a very, very easy target to attack, but one that can be solved. Uh, there are, of course, many, many other similar examples and many more in the horizon. But the key learning from this is that the progressive have to focus not in only to politics or policies, but also on the issues of governance that has been stated here already quite a few times. So essentially the question of how the state policymaking and public administration works. And if there is no reformulated and reimagined vision of the state, the state won't change by itself. That can be certain. Uh, so with COVID, there is a clear opportunity. Public eyes are on governments, uh, but that basically requires reimagining the governance, but also its methods. Uh, sharing both learnings, but also opportunities uh, throughout Europe and the globe, and tight coordination of actors in order to push uh, change uh, in, in our continent and beyond. Thanks so much. Thank you, Johan. Thank Great to end on an example of such pluralistic progressive government as, as, as Finland. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed. It's been a fantastic uh, tour of progressive politics in different countries. I think I certainly have learned a lot. I've been scribbling notes as we've been going. So thank you all. And I will now hang over, hand over to uh, Thomas Ka uh, Kalinski of the, the Desperate Policy Resentrum here in Berlin uh, to close the session and uh, look forward to the next days of the summit. I'm really excited for it. I'm sure you all are too. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, especially thank you for your charming um, chairmanship of this uh, session. I can't offer a conclusion or um, because if I could, I probably I would earn the Nobel Prize. Um, but what I want to try is to give a, like a brief uh, sum up of um, what has been said. I think we all share the notion that uh, we are in a very decisive uh, moment of time that we are right in the middle of a crossroad of all our uh, society societies which has to do not only with the pandemic but also with the internationalization and digitalization of our lives and economies with the climate and energy change challenges um, in front of us in front of us um, i think we all share the belief that under these circumstances um, we as progressive forces have the responsibility to build a new social contract um, as Patrick Diamond said, um, a, a contract not just for a couple of years or a term of a parliament, um, but rather like to build a progressive decade, um, like a progressive twenties, if you want to say so. Um, I think this is why we're all here. Um, surely we have different or similar conditions in our various countries. We've just heard of like populist movements that are a different strength, sometimes regional challenges within our uh, countries. Most of our countries search for bold change. Sometimes it's favored by, or it's fa this favors uh, progressive movements. Sometimes it's just don't, or doesn't not yet favor progressives or that do not yet profit from this feeling. And um, we are all together in like different stages in the search for short-term, medium and long-term perspective on the post-COVID um, recovery. I think what is important for us all is that we are searching for ways to bring together economic, social and ecologic change. Um, that we are, what is important to us all is that um, we try to strengthen trust in democracy, which means in their institutions, processes and results. Um, what is important to us all is to strengthen international cooperation as well as social justice. And, and um, what is important to us is to offer decent jobs and some new inspiration for everybody um, and how to form like an attractive progressive offer 
um, in this desire for change in very difficult times. I'm very happy that we join forces um, in the progressive spectrum and that we're talking about social democratic, green and liberal ideas from New Zealand, from North America, from Western, Northern, Southern and Eastern Europe. And I'm very curious about this. Um, in the next couple of days. We, had, we just had the first hour of the Progressive Government um, Summit um, in 2021. Um, thanks for everybody um, for joining, not only this session, but thanks also for all the partners for, um, for their support and bringing all this uh, together. I wish everybody um, um, of us uh, a wonderful summit. Um, and I'm, I'm quite sure that if the entire conference is as good, as interesting, and as rich as this last hour, we surely going to have a very excellent uh, summer because summit. Because I think we already seen much of the inspiration and ambitions that are needed to make people's life better and that are needed to build a progressive decade. So. Um, I wish you a, a wonderful summit. Nobody, I think nobody expected that we have a second online summit. Um, so this time, I really hope next year, same time, I will have a beer or a wine with every one of you um, and that we are far more into forming a progressive ticket. Thank you very much. And I see you around. <laughs>